to pronouns. So, Okay, so what we'd like to do today is look at the three matrices from which Jung's analytical psychology springs. We're going to be looking at three different matrices. One is his historical period, when he actually lived historically, and what he encountered. His own personal history, which could be considered a subset of that historical period, but of course viewed not from any kind of objective perspective, but actually viewed from his own subjectivity uh, completely, and the unconscious itself. So if we look first at the historical matrix, Jung's work is distinctively multidisciplinary between the larger sphere, uh, within the larger sphere of Western psychology. Jung filtered through a lot of possible professions before he centered on psychiatry. Uh, he synthesized ideas and perspectives from romantic philosophy and psychiatry, depth psychology, alchemy, mystical thought, and religion. This is why people can get very nervous when they begin to read Jung if they expect him to read like an ordinary psychologist. It's not going to happen. Claire Douglas has compared the influences that Jung encountered in his historical period to the characteristics of Switzerland, both structured and wild simultaneously. Just a little bit from Claire Douglas's work. Analytical psychology, as well as Jung's character, unites or at least forms a confederation analogous to that of the bourgeois Swiss character and its romantic countryside. There is a rational and enlightened side, which Jung in his 1965 biography called his number one character, that carefully maps analytical psychology and presents its empirically grounded psychotherapeutic agenda. The second influence resembles the natural world of Switzerland with its interest in the psyche's heights and depths, which may be compared with what Jung called his number two character. This second part is at home with the unconscious, the mysterious, and the hidden, whether in hermetic science and religion, in the occult, or in fantasies and dreams. Jung's own combination of these two aspects helped him explore the unconscious and create a visionary psychology while remaining scientifically grounded by his nation's stability. Analytical psychology still struggles to hold the tension of these opposites with different schools or leanings or even schisms, veering first to one side of the pole and then to the other. This is important to understand. Jungian psychology sort of bears witness to the turbulence of the, the time in which it was being developed by Jung and then his closest followers. There was definitely a desire to move into the direction of positivistic science. Jung came out of a university tradition that very much believed that science would completely save humanity. That was the belief that was prevalent during his time. And this really was a change that we see reflected in a lot of the theories and a lot of the, the schools of thought that emerged around this time. The idea that through human reason and rational choice, suffering could be ended. Political strife could be done away with. This was a very positivistic view. And Jung very much clinged, clung to this positivistic view uh, throughout his life, really. And so even though when we read, especially some of Jung's later works, and when we look at his timeline, we will reflect on what was happening to give rise to some of the later work. From Jung's perspective, his work was as a scientist. This was extremely important. It was, though, as a scientist, very different than what I would consider the petty science that pervades psychology today. Uh, it's, it is almost a completely different field. We, all, we should have subscripts, you know, psychology sub one and psychology sub two, because the science that Jung was talking about was a careful testing of theory with clinical practice and then finding cultural, historical, mythological amplifications for what was found. This is a very different approach to what we consider scientific method. Have a treatment, 
and a not treatment and have two groups and randomize them or control for certain factors, run your experiment, do some sort of pre and post measure and come up with a finding that has absolutely no relevance to human suffering in most cases. And those of you that are practitioners, therapists of one sort or another, uh, if you're like me, you will notice the questions people bring to you at the beginning. People inevitably ask, what will therapy be like with you? What will this treatment be like? And 20 years ago, 25 years ago, when I was starting my practice, most people were comfortable with, well, that remains to be seen. It sort of depends on what emerges as we're working. Um, and in fact, I remember I was seeing as an analysand, excuse me, I just don't want to unplug here. I was seeing as an analyst and a young psychiatrist who had come to me, and although I obviously make no requirements when people come to see me, I do have a chair and I have a couch, a standard psychoanalytic couch, the whole nine yards, wood and a pillow and the whole thing. He always came in and laid down on the couch. I didn't care. He would talk, I would listen, I would talk, blah, blah, blah. And he had, I should say that he had been through a Freudian analysis before he came to see me. And at one point in the course of his work, maybe we were seeing one another for a couple of years, um, he sat bolt upright on the couch, looked me in the eye and said, you're making this up as you go along, aren't you? <laughs> and I said, yeah, how else would I do this? <laughs> and then he laid back down, then he got back up and went to the chair and never laid down again. He kind of got it that there was nobody in that room that had any kind of power or roadmap. We were both sitting before the self. And that, we'll, we'll come to this terminology later, but that is another distinctive feature of Jung's psychology and analytical psychology as a treatment method. We follow the dictates of the self as they are revealed through products of the unconscious. And we trust in what Jung called the telos, of the unconscious, the telos of the self, the goal-directed nature of what we might call symptoms or neurosis or the presentation of the unconscious. So rather than presenting us with a set of symptoms that we feel we have to erase or cure or heal, they actually, in and of themselves, symptoms provide the direction. Symptoms provide pointers to the goal for this person. And the goal for each individual person is not normality. I, had to, I have some tapes of Jung and um, other, I uh, have one of von Franz. There was one of von Franz, but I had to leave some out, where she talks about normality. What does that mean? And about the harm that we do when we imagine that our goal is to move someone towards some sort of consensus normality. She calls it a violation and Jung would feel exactly the same.